few rivers in the Midwest can match the prestige and notoriety of Wisconsin's famous Bois Brule. Historically, its spring-fed flow and wooded shoreline played host to the vacationing elite for almost 150 years. Among its distinguished guests were lumber barons and business tycoons, as well as quite a few of our nation's presidents, hence the name River of Presidents. But these days, everyone can enjoy the splendor of this elegant little stream. All you have to do is pick up a paddle. Located in the far northwest corner of the state, the headwaters of the Bois Brule springs out of upland conifer bogs. These were formed long ago when the river flowed south, opposite of its current direction, with the outflow of then Glacial Lake Superior. Once the lake waters receded, the river turned around and began flowing in its present northerly direction. The river was first recognized as a prominent waterway for the part it played during the 1600s as the first route European explorers used to enter our nation's interior via a short portage from its headwaters over to the St. Croix, then down the Mississippi River. The earliest known name for the river was Missacota, a Chippewa word meaning burnt pines. The early French explorers picked up on this and began calling it Bois Brule, Burnt Wood River. The name Bois Brule is pronounced in many ways, none of which seem to be wrong. In the early days of the young state of Wisconsin, the indigenous boreal forest was of course looked upon as a valuable, much needed resource. The trees were quickly harvested and much of it rafted together to be floated along Superior Shore to nearby Duluth, where they were processed into lumber. The reason we are fortunate enough to have such a pristine, beautiful stream to enjoy is due in large part to the lumber giant Weyerhaeuser family, donating over 4,000 acres to the state in 1907. With it came the stipulation that no dam shall be built across the river to impede its flow. This land was later declared a state park in 1936 and since then has grown to 47,000 acres containing the entire 44 miles of the Bois Brule. Along the upper reaches of the waterway are still pockets of privately owned land skirting the riverbanks. Many of these beautifully maintained cabins and resorts once played host to the incredibly wealthy and powerful during a period in its history when the river was a popular vacation refuge. The most notable was the famous Cedar Island Lodge. Here, President Coolidge spent the entire summer of 1928 running the country out of an office in nearby Duluth during the week. On weekends, you could find him standing in the river with a fly rod in hand, hoping to bag a few trout. As the river flows north towards the big lake they call Gichigumi, it passes by fewer and fewer signs of civilization. The very nature of the river also begins to change. Where the upper river passes its time in a relaxed mood, the lower river seems to be playful and impatient, literally racing downhill towards its finish at the lake. Emptying into such a well-respected body of water is a fitting end to such an elegant little river. The Bois Brule is best known as the River of Presidents, but it could also be called River with Dual Personalities, catering to paddlers seeking peace and quiet, as well as those looking for the thrill of whitewater. Check it out! During times of high water, the river can be paddled from darn near its origin where it flows out of the bogs. The normal, most used embarking point, though, is at the landing called Stones Bridge on County Highway S. Undoubtedly, the most popular section of the river, an attractive trip of nine miles, begins here and ends at the Winnebijou Landing. On this stretch, water levels are fairly dependable for paddling, even during the drier summer months. At the beginning, this segment is slow and easy, flowing over and around huge boulders. About four and a half miles in, you'll come across a period of riffles and easy rapids, after which the river widens to form Big Lake. The river stays off and on wide and slow for the next few miles, and then you'll feel it begin to drop a little faster. These next four miles expect more exciting riffles, rocks, and class one rapids. Beginner paddlers should have little difficulty staying upright, but just in case, everyone should secure all their gear so it doesn't end up at the bottom of the river, if there should happen to be an oops moment. All access points are well marked and easily seen from the river and provide parking lots and outhouses.
Our second suggested day trip begins downstream at the State Forest Copper Range Campground and Canoe Landing and continues on for eight and a half miles. There's a second campground upstream along the previously described section. Both offer wonderfully primitive wooded sites. It won't take you long to realize the river has changed its mood. Right away, you'll be caught up in a swift current caused by the river dropping at an impressive 25 feet per mile. In this stretch, water levels become more of an issue. At 135 cubic feet per second, like you see here, the rapids are relatively tame, but still offer plenty of opportunity for play. If it were any lower, you can expect to leave much of your boat's bottom behind on the rocks. As you'd likely expect, higher levels require more expertise to paddle through the rapids and to keep boats upright. This is where the famous ledges of the Bois Brule are located. First up are Len Root ledges. At this medium level, the path over is well defined and simple to recognize. This is a good primer to what comes next. May ledges are a bit more difficult to navigate than the previous set, but it's a simple task to stop at the top and walk down the path on River Right. From here you can scout the entire series of drops, even portage around them if you'd prefer. Rapids and boulder dodging continues on from here all the way to the takeout at Highway 13. The end of the last segment is also the beginning for this next one. Although there are no more ledges or rapids of any significance, the river continues to fall at a considerable rate. During times of low water, this area can get very shallow. Paddlers may even have to walk their canoes through the worst spots. Although the State Forest's original benefactor, Frederick Weyerhaeuser, insisted that no dam shall be built across the river, in 1984, this one had to be built to protect the native trout residents from the invasive species of lamprey eels that inhabit the lake. Now the river's current begins to slacken as you approach the lake. There's a nice boat ramp on the right, or if the lake is calm, you can take advantage of this rare moment and end your trip out on its expansive beach. What was once an exclusive playground for the rich and famous is now available for all of us to enjoy, as it should be. Still, it's not hard to feel like nobility when paddling the waters of such a priceless jewel of a stream. See you on the next river.